So again, thank you once more. And for those who came in after the allyship panel, I want to say a big thank you to you as well for joining us uh, for our celebration of women in medicine and science. And as I said before, and it bears repeating, I just want to thank uh, Linda Reinman and the staff of the Office of Strategic Initiative, who is our partner on this event. And I also want to make sure and acknowledge my own staff uh, who did such a great job bringing this event together. And a big thank you to Vice Chancellor Dean Dees, who has both uh, morally supported and financially supported this uh, program for six years. It would not have been possible to do it even once without her support, let alone be able to make it an annual event. So it's my great honor to introduce Dean Dees, who will be introducing our speaker. And for those of you, many of you already know that Dean Dees is the Vice Chancellor for Health Science and the Mark and Pam Rubin Dean of the School of Medicine, a professor of psychiatry at the School of Medicine. And I know from personal experience that Dean Dees is passionate about inclusion and diversity. She's received number of national awards, too many to go into every detail today. So please join me in welcoming to the podium, Dean Deborah Dees. Thank you so much. And good evening, everyone. I really would like to thank you so much for joining us for this event this evening, the observance of women in medicine and science. I would like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Rosemary Terrell, Director of Faculty Development and the Office of Strategic Initiatives for organizing and co-hosting this event. As many of you know, during the month of September, we showcase the accomplishments of women in medicine and science and highlight advocacy related to women physicians, um, researchers, and uh, also related to health issues impacting women patients. This afternoon was just superb with the allyship panel, excellent, phenomenal, it was inspirational, and I hope that many of you, if you don't already have mentors, allies, you begin to seek them out. I would also um, like to acknowledge our provost, Dr. Liz Watkins, executive vice chancellor for attending this evening, as well as our vice chancellor for research, Dr. Rodolfo Torres for being here with us. I think they exemplify what we're, we're talking about when we talked about allyship. As you um, know, representation matters. And it's essential to have women in leadership roles in the fields of medicine and science because their contributions are often impactful. And they model for other women that they too have the ability and the capacity to make a significant difference. You saw that we had a woman on the panel, a second year medical student. And this is exactly what I meant when I told you what my mom taught me, to lift as you climb. It was important to have a second year medical student so that she too can see what she can do as an ally. And we all can be ally in different spaces. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Carrie Byington. Dr. Byington will be giving us an address today entitled, From Imposter to Leader, A Story of Integration. Dr. Byington is Executive Vice President for the University of California Health. 
And UC Health is comprised of six academic medical centers, 20 health professional schools, a global health institute, and system-wide services that improve the health of patients and the university's students, faculty, and staff. And Dr. Byington likes to remind us that our job is to improve the health of all Californians and beyond. I invite you to read her bio because I do not have the time today to go through her entire bio. She is professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco. And Dr. Byington joined us about almost two and a half, three, three years ago. And she joined us at the perfect time as the leader of all of the academic medical centers, the health professional schools, the Global Health Institute, and so forth. It was right before the pandemic. And as I talked to Dr. Byington, she reminded me that that December, she was doing something at home and casually listening to the news, and she heard about a virus. And as an infectious disease physician who's led on national and international levels, she knew that something was about. And we were so fortunate to have recruited her here as vice president for UC Health. She led UC's COVID-19 response and under her guidance, the University of California made COVID-19 vaccines accessible early during the pandemic and delivered more than 1.5 million doses. Dr. Byington is an academic physician scientist who's worked to support health equity and eliminate health disparities, especially for children. Her career accomplishments include awards from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Institutes of Health, and Drexel University College of Medicine Institute for Women, Health, and Leadership. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Inventors. She was the chair of the Infectious Disease Advisory Group for the US Olympic Committee, responsible for protecting Team USA athletes and staff from Zika virus during the 2016 Olympic Games in Brazil. I am sure you're looking forward to hearing Dr. Byington as she reflects on overcoming the societal construct of imposter syndrome and the importance of integrating our life stories as strengths for our leadership journeys. Dr. Carrie Byington. Thank you so much, Dean Dees. And it's really a privilege to be here today. This is a visit deferred by about two and a half years uh, because of the pandemic. So I'm so grateful um, to be with you. And as Dean Dees said, the title is um, From Imposter to Leader, A Story of Integration. I share with all my mentees that I felt like an imposter my entire undergraduate career, my entire medical career, until about 2005 as a full professor, I said enough, enough is enough. I am not an imposter and neither are you. There is no one in this room that is an imposter. 
Medicine has been uh, grounded in a status quo that's existed since at least 1910 in the United States following the Flexner Report of what a doctor should look like, what the, our training should look like. The Flexner Report did a lot to elevate medical education from really some elements of quackery that might have been existing and saying science needs to be part of medicine. I agree with that completely. But the time frame said that only men and only white men can be scientific enough to be physicians. So one of the unknown, um, or I think little remarked on consequence of the Flexner Report is that the universities that were dedicated to teaching women and black men medicine closed. The vast majority closed. And something that you all may not know in, in uh, this is Women in Medicine and Science Month, there were more women physicians in the late 1800s in the United States than there were after 1910 until the women's movement in the 1970s. So we were better off in the <laughs> late 1800s. Um, and so I refuse to be made to feel like an imposter. I think it is a societal construct. We all have doubts. We have doubts about our capabilities as clinicians. We have doubts about our capabilities as scientists. Those are normal. But our society tells us that we are imposters. You do not see um, majority individuals being told that they are imposters. You see women and minorities told that they are imposters. And I won't have it anymore. So um, we'll go on to how we take what is uh, unique about each one of our, each one of us and we bring it to the field. And I heard the panel today really talking about this lens of inclusion and this lens of, of thought and being. And we need the diversity of everyone because you are not like me. I am not like you. Each of us has a unique skill set to bring. And when you integrate those, we are all stronger as a society. And you will think of things that I didn't think of. Um, I will think of things that you didn't think of. And if we're able to bring those ideas to the table, we can solve you know, really big problems. So I start with um, a conflict of interest in disclosure. It's not required for today because this is not a CME bearing conference. But this is an important way for me to confirm to myself that I am not an imposter. I went through 20 years as a scientist with individuals telling me I was not a real scientist because I didn't do things the way they did things. I didn't have my own laboratory. I used clinical specimens. Um, I didn't publish in the journals that they recognized. I didn't understand the rules of the NIH. I applied to any grant that I thought I could get. I've been funded by AHRQ, CDC, NIH. I didn't know the rules. I didn't know you were supposed to get a K award and then an R award. I didn't have someone to tell me those rules. I didn't know that you were supposed to stay at one NIH institute. I've been funded by NICHD. That's the Institute for Children. NIAID. That's the Institute for Infectious Disease. National Cancer Society, a National Cancer Institute, because they were doing things in translational medicine. I applied to any grant that I thought I could get. And that's not wrong. It's just different. It's just different. And so I do have conflicts of interest. Um, I developed technology that led to two companies that have now been purchased, one by BioMaru, um, which makes the film array um, biofire diagnostic platform, which was used around the world during the pandemic. I made it for the detection of pandemics. And then the second company um, is called ID by DNA, and it was recently acquired by Illumina. And so 
yes, I didn't do research the way my male colleagues did research at my university, but it didn't mean it wasn't real research. And all of you um, have the opportunity to contribute in ways um, that we need uh, to answer the problems of today, and we need to make sure that each type of research can be included. So my objectives today are to talk a little bit about imposter syndrome, kind of the roots of it for me. You heard one of the exacerbators for me. When you go through life being told you're not really a real researcher, you know, you might internalize that. So I'm here to say, you know, fight those, uh, fight those uh, impulses to internalize it. And then I want to reflect a little bit about integration. What does integration mean? The word comes from integral, whole. So being whole, bringing your whole self, all of your skills and your experiences to inform the issues uh, that we're dealing with. I think that's the way that you are an authentic leader. Don't copy how someone else does it, but bring your own strengths to the position. So where do I come from? That is Brooks County, Texas, near the Texas-Mexico border. Um, the county has about 4,000 people in, in population. It's a very rural area on the Texas-Mexico border. Everyone in that county is my relative. And, uh, <laughs> and I grew up in an in a environment where I could be outdoors, I could be anywhere in the county because everyone was watching out for you and knew, and knew you. Uh, my family uh, was not a well-schooled family. Uh, uh, they were ranchers. Uh, the King Ranch is a very large ranch there. They were ranchers, had been ranchers for generation, generations. My father was the first to go to college, and my mother. So my father and mother were the first to go to college, and they really taught me uh, that education can change uh, your life. My father became an engineer, my mother a teacher, and we lived a very solid middle-class life, different from the majority of, of my family in Brooks County. But, and this is what, um, this is the large extended kind of family. This is a painting uh, from Carmen Lomas Garza, someone who grew up about 30 miles from where I grew up. And that's what our houses looked like. That's what our backyards looked like. I grew up with a very loving, extended family um, that was different my experiences in this setting and this family were different than the experiences of the other medical students that I encountered uh, when I went to medical school. And things that I thought made me weaker as a student um, were actually what I've now discovered to be my strengths. When I went to medical school August 1st, 1985, um, I encountered a group of people who came from wealthier backgrounds than I had come from, who had traveled outside of the United States, traveled all over Europe, spoke French, I spoke Spanish, um, had done things that I had never done, gone to an opera, eaten sushi, I mean, things that I had no experience of. But they also ha did not have that experience which really um, gave me a sense of who I was, where I belonged, um, and what I wanted to do. So growing up in that family, I saw what I now know are health disparities. I didn't know them. But what I did know was I was watching my aunts die of breast cancer when they were in their 30s and 40s. Um, I didn't know that we had an inherited gene for breast cancer. And we certainly didn't have access to uh, chemotherapy, clinical trials, even just basic treatment. And that was one of the things that really pushed me to want to become a physician. And at a very young age, I started saying that I wanted to become a physician. And I felt like it really, these are the values that my parents really instilled in me. My father went to Texas A&M. If you go to Texas A&M and you ask anyone, what are the core values of Texas A&M? They will tell you respect, excellence, leadership, loyalty, integrity, and selfless service. And they drilled those into me as a child and my siblings 
And to me, those are the values of a physician. And when I started to say I wanted to be a doctor, what I got from my very loving family was Mihika. Girls can't be doctors. And that was the seed of, I think, imposter syndrome. When your family tells you you can't, you know, it's hard. And they weren't trying to hold me back. They were trying to protect me. Um, and so I had to spend time convincing them that it was a pathway that I could follow. When I would hear, girls can't be doctors, doctors can't get married, they meant women doctors. Uh, women doctors can't have children. I had to constantly show that maybe it was possible. And as I began to do well in school and in college and get interviews for medical school, my entire family, my entire county became my biggest supporters, like really, really cheering me on. And when I went to my parents in my third year of medical school to say my then boyfriend and I were going to marry, both my mother and father said simultaneously, but you've come so far. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? And they said, don't you have to quit medical school now? And you only have one more year. And I'm like, no, you don't have to quit medical school. And they've been amazed that I've had two children and been able to do many things. So, so that is where I come from. And this is where I am now. As Dr. Dees said, the University of California health system is the largest academic health system in the United States and one of the best academic health systems in the world. It is not easy to jump from Falfurius, Texas to Oakland, California as the executive vice president of, of UC Health. And it, it took a lot to get there and I am constantly aware that I am a statistical anomaly. I should not be here in front of you today. Um, when the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, used to track uh, Hispanic by uh, Puerto Rican, Mexican American in the various ways, I was able to see in the data that there are seven Mexican American women full professors in the United States. Seven. I am one of them, and I have never met another one. I hope very much one of you medical students is going to join, you know, join me in these ranks because um, we have to open up this, uh, open up this profession. So how did I get here? I had a mentor, literally one mentor who changed my life uh, as a medical student. His name was Dr. Ralph Feigen, the pediatric infectious disease, doc disease doctor. He wrote the textbook called Feigen and Cherry that everyone uses. And he took a great interest in medical students, especially those who are going to go into pediatrics. And so as a third year medical student, um, he called me into his office and asked me what I wanted to do, what I aspired to do. And I said, well, I'm going to become a pediatrician. Yes. And um, my husband and I were going to join the Peace Corps after you know, our training. And he said to me, you want to join the Peace Corps because you want to make a difference. I said, yes, I want to make a difference. And he said, Carrie, the way you make a difference in the lives of children is through research. I had no idea what he was talking about. I left that meeting so confused trying to understand, what did he mean by that? What, what kind of research can I do? And I finished med school a little bit early um, in December. And I got married, I finished med school on December 16th. I got married on December 17th. And uh, <laughs> much to the celebration of my parents, who would have liked a grandchild on December 18th, but <laughs> that was eight years away. And so, um, so he asked me, would you like to start residency now, in January, when you come back from your honeymoon, or do you want to wait and start with the rest of your class in July? Well, anyone who's been a pediatrician knows you should never start PEDS internship in January. <laughs> That's when all the respiratory viruses hit. 
And so I said, <laughs> I said, no, I'll start in July with the rest of my class. And he said, great, you can work with the Centers for Disease Control for six months on research. And we were having the largest measles outbreak in the nation in the post-vaccine era in 1989, 1990. And he had me work with the Centers for Disease Control. And my job was to go and find controls for their case control study. But instead, what I found, every single person that I interviewed, man, woman, child, they all had measles. I saw a 1,000 cases of measles, which is really unusual. Um, and um, we would collect data. I had had measles as a child, so I was immune. I was the one drawing the blood, collecting the data. And we would send our results to the Centers for Disease Control most evenings, or at least you know a couple times a week. And it was the data that we were collecting then and there and sending to the CDC that resulted in the CDC saying, you don't need just one measles vaccine, you need two. And it changed the recommendation for vaccination. Um, and that recommendation exists today. It's still in effect. And I show the graph because that was the outbreak before the second shot came in. And then you see the arrow when the second shot was introduced and the outbreak was over. I had seen six pregnant women and their babies die of measles. I had seen suffering from measles, seizures, all kinds of terrible things in the ICU. And I saw it end with a second shot. And that's when I understood, yes, you do change lives through research. And it changed my trajectory 100%. And so I went to UCSF <laughs> to get a pediatric infectious disease fellowship and to learn how to do research. And so this is one of the things I want to leave you with, is that to be open, we've heard that, be open to where your career may go. It might not be in the direction that you expect it to, but be open to it, and then really prepare yourself. Be prepared for what may come. So I like to show this, because where did I go? I went to Texas A&M Public School. Baylor College of Medicine is the only private school I've ever been to but I chose it because I felt like it was the best medical school in Texas. Then I went to UCSF, and then I was a faculty member at the University of Utah, another public institution. I show that because so many times I hear we have to have the right pedigree. Harvard, Hopkins, Stanford, nothing else is good enough. And I'm here to tell you that's not true. We can get an extraordinary education, extraordinary experiences, no matter where we are. And it's all up to how much we put into it and what we get out of what's right in front of us. So to the best of your ability, become an expert in your field. Pray, seek opportunities that are hard, that challenge you. For the faculty here, where did I find those opportunities? I sought them in my professional societies. So the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Infectious Disease Society of America, those were my professional organizations. I sought opportunities. Write a guideline. What does it take to write a guideline? Be on a committee, you know, review, uh, do things for the meetings for your societies. And I learned so much. And I got to network with people outside of my institution and from around the country and I learned a great deal. I also um, was not afraid to do hard things. Be a principal investigator for a center for translational science when people weren't sure that was the right thing to do. But I really believe in crossing borders. I really believe in sharing uh, across disciplines. So I was going to invest in that. Um, and I ultimately was able to uh, be on the Red Book, which I shared with Deborah today, that was my lifetime goal. Dr. Feigen had put that dream in my head to be on the Red Book, and I was selected for the Red Book in 2007. I felt like it was the greatest honor of my life. And when I was at the, at the, at the conference, I mean, I was so giddy, like almost euphoric. I, I couldn't believe it. And then I was served on that committee for 11 years. I chaired it for four years during Zika and Ebola, it really was um, you know, a fulfillment of so much of what I wanted to do. Um, I think because of that experience, I was chosen to, for the Olympic experience was really 
really awesome. And then I also sought out additional training. You've heard of ELAN, you heard it today. Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine, both Deborah and I are graduates of the program. Um, what you may not know is we have about 55 graduates of the program across the University of California system. And in July, I brought together, well in January, I brought together all of those alumni and we selected someone to lead us, Dr. Amparo Villablanca at uh, UC Davis. And she has uh, just launched July 1st, the Group on Inclusive Leadership for Women. And one of our goals is to make sure that all the colleges that are eligible for ELAM, which include medicine, public health, dentistry, that all of the colleges are nominating and that all of the schools are nominating. And because everyone can't go to ELAM, that those graduates from UC, that, that they come back and they share the knowledge broadly across uh, the organization. So hopefully, even though we have 55 graduates now, maybe we'll have 100 or 200 or more, and they'll help lead us uh, into the future. So I've learned a lot being in academic medicine. I put some of the lessons up here that I think are really important. Um, but I, I truly believe that everything that you do in life teaches you a lesson if you are willing to learn. It means you have to have your eyes open. It means when you're in a bad situation, you reflect on it and understand why is it bad? Um, what have I learned from it? And so I put number one, to find a mentor if you can. Um, Ralph Feigen changed my life. And um, I will always say his name and recognize him. He changed my life. The second, which I think is, is just as important, is to, number one, know your values and hold on to your values. Your values are the most important thing that you have when times are tough, when you have to make a decision. You need to be values driven. I had to depend on that throughout COVID, trying to make decisions you know, for a very large organization. Step up and advocate for others. You had, a, you had an entire panel today on allyship. You have to advocate for those that don't have a voice, especially if you do have a voice. You have to be fearless. I heard uh, one person say, what's the worst that can happen? They'll tell you no. It took me a long time to accept that being told no is not that big of a deal. It's okay. You're told no, try again the next day. I'm very persistent. So be, be fearless. Be persistent. Be bold. If you don't see the future that you want, invent it. Invent it. Don't let someone tell you that it can't be done. In fact, that's one of my biggest motivators. When someone says, we've never done it that way, or that can't be done, it's like, watch me. We, we're, we're going to do it. And I have so many examples of that. And then as, as I said, um, and as you heard Dean Dee say in my introduction, let your life experiences and skills shape your unique leadership contributions. Every one of you can contribute in a unique way. So some of the things that, that I had to learn how to do was to be my own mentor. You heard me say I had a phenomenal, life-changing mentor. I had him during medical school and residency, where I would see him at least weekly, regularly. And then I went off. I went to UCSL. I went to the University of Utah. I wasn't able to see him very regularly. Um, I would see him maybe once a year at the pediatric meetings. I always knew he was there in a crisis or an emergency but I didn't have a day-to-day -day mentor. And one of the things that I try to teach my fellows and others is how to be your own best mentor. You know yourself better than anyone else. You need discipline. You need to be able to weigh opportunities and say, is this good? Is this, is this taking me on the path that I want to go? Or is it taking me down a road I'm not you know, sure that's where I want to go? You have to learn to prioritize, to set goals, to set boundaries, and to define success for yourself. There's no one out there who's going to say, oh, 
Carrie Byington successful because she was on the right book. But I say it. <laughs> I say it, and I get to say it. And you get to say what makes you um, successful. And I think you can learn from absolutely everyone you meet. I didn't have formal mentors. Like, no one was coming and sitting with me and saying, let's talk about your research. What do you think you're going to do with pneumococcus? No, I didn't have that. What I had were my colleagues, um, both at my institution, outside my institution, and I had students and trainees. I've learned so much. I started a Native American program. I don't think I've ever learned more than from uh, those students and what they brought and what they taught me about life in the United States that I did not know. And um, so you can learn from everyone. Sometimes, some of these people are people who showed me how I didn't want to be. That can be just as important. And some of these people that you see at the bottom were not living. I never met them. But their life histories were written, documented, and absolutely inspiring because I always knew they had it way worse than I had. So in that picture, you see um, the first Native American woman physician in the United States, Susan Lafleche uh, Pico um, in the black and white. And next to her is uh, Ella Schiff, one of the uh, Mormon women physicians in the 1800s in the state of Utah, because Brigham Young actually thought women should be physicians in the 1800s and sent them to the East Coast to train. And then this uh, Dr. Mary Ann Headley Egerton, the first woman physician from South Texas. And, you know, really, really inspirational people. Um, and then finally, Ellen Tracy, Elizabeth Tracy, sorry, the uh, Rosalind Franklin of Tularemia. If we have time later, I will tell you about her, but from Utah. And then I found real mentorship in my ELAM learning community. So ELAM, we've mentioned it a ton of times, it's great. They teach you things, they teach you skills. How do you do strategic planning? How do you lead a meeting? But the very best thing they do is connect you with a learning community. And we have stayed together, my learning community. We presented a, um, at the AAMC an abstract called Once a Year and Every Other Friday. Because we were together in 2000 and seven and eight is the program, and we still, to this day, meet once a year and every other day. On the phone, in person, to help each other to grow and to, um, to mentor. And so it's been fantastic. So find, uh, find your peer mentors where you can as well. And one of the things that I learned from this is that mentorship really matters. So at the University of Utah, I started a mentorship program for where, where I saw a gap in clinical and translational science. And through this mentorship program, one of the byproducts of it was we got lots and lots of grants. And you can see that there, 110 million in the first several years. That number is now 170 million. But the grants that we got went to men and women. By having this open um, uh, matrix mentoring model, women signed themselves up for it, signed themselves up for the two-year program. They weren't recommended by anyone. They just came. And we ended up getting so many funded principal investigators at the University of Utah that were women. And it made a real difference in what the research environment looked like at our institution. And I learned by helping others, I actually grew and, um, and, and had more attention, more national prominence than I had by just trying to work on my own. This, I think, work led me to be recruited to Texas A&M. And I served in a, a leadership role there, much like uh, Dean Dees as dean and uh, vice chancellor and was able to um, create an opportunity for essentially a new medical school of engineering medicine 
in Houston, um, built the first building that you see there, worked with leaders to build the entire plaza, and has really created a, a new field, engineering medicine. We call those trainees physician years. It answered the need for technology and medicine, and it was great and exciting work. And I also uh, was able to work with the other CEOs and deans of the medical schools in the Texas Medical Center, University of Texas, Baylor College of Medicine, where I was an alumni, MD Anderson, and Texas A&M, because now I'm the new kid on the block in the medical center. And I'm like, why don't we work together? We should be working together. Those medical schools never worked together. But we decided that we could bring different scientific disciplines together. Um, they said, well, what's A&M going to bring? You're not scientific enough. You're the newest medical school. You're the new kid on the block. I said, we're bringing engineering, and we've also got an amazing vet school, and every one of the products that you make needs to be tested in a small animal and a large animal to get an FDA approval, and we'll bring that. And they said, okay. And we also had a lot of money. And so, <laughs> so I learned that too. And, and so we together invested almost a billion dollars to build what's called the Texas Medical Center III uh, Clinical and Translational Science Award uh, Collaborative Institute that is under construction now. That's what it will look like. And you see this panel. That's the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, the mayor of uh, Houston, Sylvester Turner, and then the chancellors and CEOs of all of the medical stuff. Do you notice anything about that <laughs> picture? Those are some of the hardest meetings I've ever been in. Um, I think women, the way that we are raised in this society, we know how to collaborate. We know how to bring people together. That's a real skill. This would not have happened. I can tell you, my chancellor who's right there, he would not have been on that stage. You don't just go say, give me $250 million. You know, he wouldn't have been there. Those others wouldn't have been there. Um, and I was really, really proud of this work. But standing on that stage, I was like, where am I? Why, why, what am I doing here? Is this who I really am? And you all heard some of my background. I went into medicine to end health disparities. Yes, I'm a researcher. Yes, I love translational research. Yes, that's going to be a good thing. But it was kind of off my course of, of ending health disparities and working towards universal health care. I felt distracted, and I also felt alone, absolutely alone. So what did I do? I called my mentors. I called my peer mentors again, and we talked through it. And they said, remember what your values are. Go back to your values. And actually, I show this to you because this is the value statement crafted for UC Health. People ask me in the interview, what's the first thing you're going to do? I said, we're going to write a value statement because we didn't have it. This is our value statement. We published it January 2020 and just in time because we would have never had time to do it after that. And I went back to this again and again and again. Um, these are our values. And they said, remember your values. Remember who you speak for. You know, I had written in the past about ending disparities, about opportunities for women. Think about that. Remember those things. Who do you want to be? And something will come. Um, I speak for inclusion. I speak for opening the doors. These are some of my Native students. Um, I serve on the Robert Wood Johnson um, uh, Harold Amos Foundation to train um, minority scientists. Remember who you are, and something will come. And sure enough, my former boss called me and said, you haven't been answering your phone. And I was like, oh, too busy. <laughs> and they're like, this search firm from University of California is calling. Answer your phone. And that phone call 
changed my life. And I was able to come. I told Deborah uh, that one hour interview was one of the most invigorating conversations I'd had about the future of healthcare in a really long time. I could see that our values were aligned and I just knew that California would work towards universal health care and UC could be an important part of it. So I made the decision to move and to come here. And I was so excited to dig in Medi-Cal, universal, I'm, all of it. And I came October 31st and I had just started going to the tours and I was scheduled to come to Riverside, but, but no, life intervenes. <laughs> And we had a moment that we needed to meet, um, and we met it. University of California Health met this moment. I love poetry. I love this poem. This is from a UCSF poet in residence. The world asks of us only the strength we have, and we give it. And it asks more, and we give it. And you see health gave it. All of you gave it. You all saved lives. We saved lives. We changed the trajectory of the pandemic in this state. We took care of the first patients in California, January 25th, uh, 2020. We prepared so well for wave one that we were able to send our healthcare providers to New York, which was inundated, to the Navajo Nation, and to Mexico, reflecting our values and our commitment to everyone. We rallied our five CTSAs to do clinical trials. I talked to our CTSAs. I said, we are going to do every clinical trial of any drug that might work, that we think has enough you know, science that it might work, and every vaccine. We developed a single IRB so that I could call the CEOs of the Regeneron that make, made remdesivir, Pfizer, Moderna, to say, we will enroll at every UC site. Our IRB will be done in 24 hours. We enrolled for every major trial. And not only did we enroll in our sites on the Hill, but we took the buses out so that we could enroll in communities that were being hardest hit, so that we would have an equity win to clinical trials. We contributed the most minority participants in both the Moderna and Pfizer trials in the United States through the UC system. We also took testing and vaccines where they needed to be delivered into the agricultural field, into the maculadoras across the border, into, um, into the places where our vulnerable populations are. We took testing. We took vaccines. We lived our service commitment to UC, to UC in the state of California. We were also innovative. We were the first ones to do the vending machines for um, testing. That's done everywhere now. That came from UC. And we stood up early in the pandemic and said, we will recommend vaccines for everyone, even before there was a vaccine candidate. We started prepping our employees, our students, our unions to say there will be a vaccine and it will be required for everyone. So crisis leadership gives you a lot of opportunities. Um, I said to groups today, I knew taking a new leadership role in a big institution, there would be a crisis. And I am grateful that that crisis was in my wheelhouse. It could have been a different kind of crisis but I was able to use my skills and by using them, build trust across the organization and to learn um, and meet people all through the organization. There are some here that will tell you that they've been on a hundred, a thousand Zooms with me as we prepped for the COVID response. Um, but that builds, um, that builds your capability, your network, your ability to collaborate. And if you do it right, then you can use those skills for something else. And I'll close by just talking about work that I am very, very proud of. Um, and that is our care for the unaccompanied children at the border. And this purposely did not get press because we wanted to protect those children. We didn't want press all over. But the AAMC called together 
all of the CEOs of academic health centers in the United States and said, we have a crisis at the border. There are these children. They need to be cared for. We need you all to help us. And their plan was, their ask was, would we send individual physicians and nurses to volunteer at shelters around the country? And yes, we would do that, and we did do that. But we said we can do better than that. We are a system. Let's engage every aspect of our system and, and have a system-wide approach. And we stood up two emergency intake centers, one in San Diego and one in Long Beach. And every single academic health center participated and contributed expertise, uh, equipment. We stood up these emergency intake shelters within uh, three to seven days. And we provided care for these children over five months, quietly, your colleagues, volunteering on weekends, volunteering uh, for night shifts. We made uh, electives for residents because residents were allowed to be there. We made a curriculum. Um, and we worked to protect these children. We had great outcomes. We cared uh, for 4,915 children at these two sites over five months. They were between the ages of 3 and 17. Think about that. Alone in a shelter at age three. Just let that sink in for a minute. All of them had extraordinary medical care from pediatric specialists. They were all screened for COVID, because we did this during COVID. So not only did we have to take care of the problems that they had from crossing the border, but we had to make sure we weren't having COVID outbreaks in these centers. We immunized everyone, and we said to the federal government, we need to be able to give COVID vaccine to these children. That was not allowed. But our advocacy allowed it to happen. And then these are some of the statistics. And we kept them in a safe environment, a clean environment, and also a child-friendly environment. We had books and school and games and sports and um, entertainment. Singers came. Sports figures came, the LA Dodgers came, the LA Lakers came. I mean, these kids had toys and clothes and, and food, food that was specific for their country of origin. We took care of them. And we achieved these beautiful reunions. Um, this is a mother and daughter who had been separated for 10 years, who were able to reunite in San Diego. We have, have 4,900 of those stories. It was remarkable, life-changing for every single person who participated in this. This was a reflection of who we are as a system, a reflection of our values. And I would ask you to think about that AAMC meeting of every CEO in the country at, at an academic center who was asked for help. Only one devoted the system, their system, to this. Do you think it might be because I'm from the border, I'm a mother, and a pediatrician? The lens in which you view life tells you what's important. And um, I am perhaps most proud of this, um, of anything that I've been able to work on in my career. And so I will just leave you with another poem that I leave for all my fellows and trainees. Um, every one of you here is filled with life, and you are here to shine. And I hope that you will. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for an outstanding talk. I'm going to invite Dean Dees back up to present a gift, oh. and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Byington, Carrie, for giving of your time, your energy, 
your knowledge. You've just um, given so much of yourself to the UC system and to all of us. And uh, we hope that you'll be visiting UCR, the campus, as well as the School of Medicine, many more times. And we just can't wait to learn so much more from you. Your um, talk has been so inspirational and I'm sure they have a lot of questions. But we would like to um, give you this on behalf of UCR School of Medicine, the Office of Faculty Development, and the Office of Strategic Initiatives. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we'll have questions. You want to leave that? I'll bring the mic to you if you have questions. Um, hello, I'm Maya. Thank you again for coming. Um, I think your work on um, children that were abandoned at the border was um, is really inspiring. And I think there's, in the United States, especially in California, there's a lot of things um, related to the foster care system and the homeless pediatric population. Um, is there anything that you're working on now related to that or anything that you know of that's related to that? Thank you. With everything that's been going on with COVID, I haven't been able to dig into the pediatric issues that I would really love to do as a pediatrician. Um, in my past life, I was the pediatrician for the foster care program um, at the University of Utah, so I know that population really well. And I've definitely supported the students who are advocating for basic needs for foster uh, youth that graduate, you know, that age out of the system and, and that we have here at the University of California. But one of the things that I'm hoping to embark on when we've actually started the, um, the different stakeholder meetings is a strategic plan for all of UC Health. Um, each of you has strategic plans for your own campus, but I'd like to have one, like what are our overarching strategic goals? And we have four children's hospitals within our system. So how do we use those um, resources uh, to improve the lives of kids in California? And I think that that will be an important topic for our strategic planning. And if you have ideas or you know of things, I'd love to hear from them. And people say that and they think, oh, yeah, sure, I'll send her an email. I would like you to know that one of your student colleagues at UC San Diego, Alec Kalak, uh, MD-PhD student, um, sent an email to me in probably my first month at UC um, Health, and he said, um, you know, I'm really interested in Native American health, and I'm a member of, of a tribe, and I really am interested in it, and what do you know about it? And I said, well, hey, I'm going to be at UC San Diego next week. Let's meet. And what he didn't know is that I'd be really interested in it, too. And from that conversation, the new Native American Prime program was born. So that program uh, now is uh, at UC San Diego and UC Davis. It got state funding, and the first students, the first students were admitted and started uh, this summer. So change can come, and I do listen to everybody's emails. At least read them. <laughs> if I can act on them, I will. <laughs> Other questions? Hello. Well, it was great seeing your presentation. My name is Miguel. Um, what, how did you manage all the different roles in your life, um, going through med school, going to being a physician, and where you're currently at as being a mother, um, being a wife, and being a student and a professional? Because that's very difficult sometimes. Well, I think every time. <laughs> all the time, yeah. I, I think it's very difficult. Um, and I've done it better and worse at, at different times. I think... Um, um, having balance is not really a thing. Yeah, you're gonna have times where this grant is 
taking every moment of your time or this budget is taking every moment of your time or this patient is taking every moment of your time or your child, your own child is taking every moment of your time. So I think you, I've just learned to accept that um, I can't always do it all at the same time. And I'll be um, somewhat serious, but also somewhat flip. Like, what are some things that help me? My hair's pretty short, you know? <laughs> this, is, this is not a priority. I don't, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't wear a lot of, I mean, there, you know, there's just some things that gotta go by the wayside, right? I, um, I don't need a ton of sleep and I have a very supportive husband. So if I have some advice, it's like prioritize things that are really important. Hair's not really important. Find an excellent partner. <laughs> That's way, way more important. <laughs> Great question. Anybody else? Dr. Byington, I, I love the, where you posted up there, hold on to your values as your prime thing. And I don't want to invade your privacy, but I'm going to. Uh, with this question, you can tell me to get lost. Could you share with us one moment in your career where hold on to your values was difficult and might even involve risk and share with us how you dealt with it? There are a million moments that I could share, but let's talk COVID. And what are my values? My values are, you know, ensuring the health of individuals around me. And being a new leader at a huge organization, coming from outside the organization, and really not knowing anyone except my friend from the ELAM, you know, who was at UCLA, but truly not knowing anyone, and then saying to the president, to the chancellors, for the health and safety of our students, our employees, our communities, we have to close, and you're going to lose money, was not easy but you have to hold on to your values and just keep speaking what you know is true, say what you don't know. And if you think about like one of my first board meetings after the March wave of the pandemic, I got to go tell them that we lost $1.2 billion in six weeks, you know? <laughs> Um, but that I was confident we had done the right thing and that lives had been saved and we would be able to make up the financial losses. So that's one <laughs> example. <laughs> Someone else had their hand up over here, but I don't remember oh, what it was. The who was. Just, there we go. Thank you. Now they turn away from the Yes.
I did have a little bit of a chance to talk with faculty and leaders today and the students. And I get asked a lot, UC Health, what is it? What's your job? What do you do? You know? <laughs> and wherever I can, I see my role uh, to help make UC work as a system in areas where it benefits us all. So some of the things that I hope will come out of the strategic plan is a system-wide commitment to say, let's look at the state. Where are the health gaps in the state? And how do we fill it in? Not in a parochial, uh, my campus can do this catchment area, but rather together. How, and, and we want a lot of things. So how can we partner with the state? I think we should be partnering much more with the state. I talk with the governor. I talk with uh, Secretary Galley to say, I come from two red states that turn to their public university as their thought partner, as their clinical delivery partner, as their education partner. That needs to happen in the state of California. And that takes some trust building. So that's one thing. And I think UCR has so much to offer to the system. Um, on the education side, uh, when I first met Deborah, she was like, our entire campus is a prime program. You know, it's not like we have eight prime students. Our whole campus is a prime program. You have that um, to show to the other campuses how that works. You have this spirit of collaboration with your community and deep knowledge of the community. How do you share those skills across the whole system? And what are the other skills that the other campuses have that they can share with you? And so uh, research is a big piece of it. Um, we have five clinical translational science award centers in our system, five. The UT system only has four, and they don't even work together. We have put them together in a braid, but why is it only the five campuses that have a CTSA? All 10 of our campuses, all of our national labs should be part of the braid and should share in those resources. So I think that um, from a clinical perspective, an education perspective, and a research perspective, there are opportunities for systemness. During COVID, uh, we made a single IRB for clinical trials, but also for our COVID data set. That meant going to 10 different IRBs. And now the CORDS COVID data set is universally system-wide approved. Any researcher from UC can use it, and you don't have to apply for separate IRB. This shouldn't be a one-off. It should be just a given. Do you know how long it took me to get library access? <laughs> Two years. Two years to get library access. And I didn't have time. Like, they would send me something, and then it wouldn't work because it wouldn't be with UCOP. And, it would, and you know, it, it just it, two years. And so I was relying on the fact that I'm still an emeritus faculty at the University of Utah. For all two, the first two years of COVID, I used the Utah library because I didn't have access to a UC library. That's a scandal. We, <laughs> we can't work like that. You know? And so why shouldn't a UC Riverside student have access to the UCSF library and vice versa? I'm interested in having a system-wide match for graduate medical education. We should be able to stand up as a system and say, we are confident in the graduates of every health professional discipline at the University of California. And if you graduate, from medical school at the University of California, Riverside, I would be proud to have you as a family medicine or internal medicine or peds resident at UCSF or Davis or UCLA. Why aren't we not leveraging the system? Doing those kinds of things would lower debt. I think it would really improve the mental health outcomes of students who are worried about matching. I think it would improve 
improve our retention of our health professional graduates. So I could go on and on. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things, but my job is to help us see that in, in, there are areas where we can work better as a system and to try to eliminate some of those barriers to systemness. And I need the faculty to help me because you all have all the power, honestly. <laughs> if you all want it, the regents can't ignore it. If I, the administrator, want it, eh. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Going once. <laughs> I know it's late. It's time Going to Going twice. Yeah. <laughs> Please join me in Thank thanking Dr. Byington. <laughs> Thank you so much. And one last thank you to all of you for joining us for this celebration of women in medicine and science. I really appreciate that you found value in uh, celebrating this important event. Thank you all. Have a lovely evening.